I will make you fishes of men. fishes of men. Matthew chapter 4. Throughout the entire month, we're going to be dealing very closely um, with, this, with this thought about being fishers of men. We're going to preach it about it in abundance throughout the entire month. It's not going to be a particular series that we, that we follow like we have been, but the subject matter is going to continue to be the same throughout the entire month. At the end of the month, on um, the 28th, we will be having a, a dinner afterwards, a potluck dinner afterwards, and that is going to be the day that I have designated as called Fill, Fill the House. This is the day we want to bring everybody that we possibly can into the church uh, for our, to culminate in, in our, our last uh, particular service for this um, outreach promotion. Um, at that day, we will also be giving away a prize to the person that brings the, the most amount of visitors. Um, and, uh, and then we will also have that time of fellowship downstairs. And so, uh, let me encourage you, uh, bring people with you. Make sure you bring somebody to church. I would hate to see somebody get a grand prize for bringing, and because only one person was brought to church. Um, but if that's what it is, that's what it is. And, and I think Brother Manuel is one up on everybody right now. He brought his grandson, so he's one up. So, um, so this morning, uh, let me just encourage you. Uh, bring somebody to church with you. That's what this whole month is dedicated to. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you. We must repent of what we have been and rejoice in what we may become. It is, or it is not follow me because of what you already are. It is not follow me because you may make something of yourselves, but rather follow me because of what I will make you. Truly, I might say of each one of us, as soon as we are converted, what we will be has not yet been made known, according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Brother Spurgeon continues on, it, uh, it did not seem a likely thing that lowly fishermen would develop into apostles, that men so skillful with the fishing net would be quite as much at home in preaching sermons and instructing converts. One would have said, how can these things be? You cannot make founders of churches out of peasants of Galilee. That is exactly what Christ did. And when we are humbled in the sight of God by a sense of our own unworthiness, we can feel encouraged to follow Jesus because of what he can make us into. What said the woman of a sorrowful spirit when she lifted up her song? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sets them with princes. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 8. We cannot know what God may make of us in the new creation. Who could have imagined all the beautiful things that came out from darkness and chaos by that one command, let there be light. 
And one who can and who can tell what lovely displays of everything that is divinely pleasing may yet appear from a person's formerly dark light. When God's grace has said to them, let there be light. Oh, you, uh, you who presently see in yourselves nothing that is desirable, come and follow Christ. For the sake of what he can make out of you, don't you hear his sweet voice calling you and saying, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men? Charles Spurgeon was one of the greatest evangelists that ever walked the planet. And he had, I believe, a very... Um, insightful grasp on this concept of, of being fishers of men. It's not in what we are, uh, are, are able to do or what our abilities are, but it is what Christ can make us into. Amen? It's what Christ can make us into that's important. See, we all come to the table with certain skills. We all come to the table with certain gifts and abilities. But those gifts and abilities, we must understand, first and foremost, they are given to us by Jesus Christ. Amen? They were created in us. For many of us, these skills are undeveloped. And that's part of the process that Jesus wants us to understand. This is a developmental process that we go through to become fishers of men. Not one of us in this room are so gifted that we can just sway the masses. Amen? You think about Billy Graham. Billy Graham just didn't step into the pulpit the very first time and fell to just sway the masses. But it was a gift that God gave him, an anointing that God gave him that was developed over time that God opened up opportunities and doorways that he was able to reach the masses. Amen? So, to, uh, so this morning I want you to pay very close attention to this idea or this thought that God is the one who makes us fishers of men. There are three very important points to this thought this morning that I'd like us to consider. As we press into this month on focusing on reaching the lost in our community, and with our theme for the month being fishers of men, let us consider the following. To become a fisher of men, we must first, first follow Jesus. We must be followers of Christ. Now I know this seems quite elementary, but it's here in the simplicity of the gospel that often becomes our greatest obstacle. Are you aware of that? You know something, John? I have, I have, in my experience in serving the Lord, it's never been the deep theological issues that has tripped me up in my life. Eric, it's always been the simplicity. Can it possibly be this simple? Right? Can it possibly be this easy? Can it possibly be this cut and dry? And you know what I found, Sheila? Yes, it is. Jesus said, remember I preached about this. Jesus said, I come to offer you a better way. To show you a better way. Why? Because the sacrificial system was very difficult. Even to go into the temple... The priest had to go through a plethora of cleansing and washing and prayers and dedications and all of these things. And, and the high priest, even that much more. And how much confidence did man have in that high priest? He had so much confidence that they tied a rope onto his leg and they put bells on his ephod. You know what that meant? When the bells stopped ringing, pull on the rope because something had gone wrong. Amen. How much confidence did they have? Well, the Bible says what the blood and bulls and goats could not do in that it was weak in the flesh. Jesus Christ was sent to offer us a better way. So understand this morning, we're not talking about deep theological issues that become stumbling blocks to us. That rarely is the case. It's usually the simplicity, the simplicity of the gospel. First, I will take it for granted that every believer here wants to be useful to Jesus. And if that's the case, it's really simple. I, I'm assuming every one of us in the building today want to be usable for the Lord. I hope that's the case. If that is the case, it's really simple. Follow Jesus, and he will make you fishers of men. A young man once asked, what is the best way to become an effective preacher? One person answers, go to seminary. But Christ says, young man, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. Amen? How is a person to be useful? 
Attend a training class, one says. That's true, but there is a much better answer than going to a training class. How about this? Follow Jesus, and he will make you a fisher of men. The great training school for Christian workers has Christ as its teacher. And he, and he is at its head, not only as a tutor, but also as a leader. We are not only to learn of him in study, but to follow him in action. Amen. It's just not enough, Doug, to read about it. We have to take what we're reading and apply it. By applying it, that means we will begin to follow in his footsteps. Amen. How many ever heard that when I, when I first got saved, this is what they used to tell us. Read the red and get the power. Read the red. What that means is, in a red letter edition Bible, everything that is written in red was the words of Jesus himself. Read the red, get the power. Why? Paul had great things to say, didn't he? James had great things to say, didn't he? Peter had great things to say. John had great things to say. But the reality of it is, none of those things could save their life. Amen. It was the words that Jesus spoke. When he said that day, we saw him in the video, they were fishing. They're out there fishing. And Jesus comes by and, and his response or his, re his request is very, very simple. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And what did they do? Immediately, the Bible says, they left their nets and began to follow Christ. Wow, what faith. What vision. Amen. Something that compelled them to do something that was completely foreign to them. Listen, these weren't priests. These weren't, weren't young men and women that was in a synagogue. They weren't in a seminary. Amen? But here they were just working their job. Amen? And Jesus happens by their way. Well, did he happen by? No, he went purposely to them to reveal to them who he was. Let me go on here. The great training school for Christian workers has Christ as its teacher and as its head. Not only as a tutor, but also as a leader. We are not only to learn of him in study, but to follow him in action. Follow me, he said, and I will make you fishers of men. The direction is very distinct and plain, and I believe that it is exclusive, so that no one can become a fisherman by any other process. Let me read that again. I thought, that was a very, I thought that was a very important statement. The direction is very distinct and plain, and I believe that it is exclusive so that no one can become a fisherman by any other process. How do we become fishers of men? By following Christ. There is no other way. Amen? There is no other way. There is no other way to impact the soul than to follow after Jesus and tell somebody, follow me as I follow Christ. This process may appear to be very simple, but assuredly, it is most effective. The Lord Jesus Christ, who knew all about fishing for men, was himself the absolute ruler of the rule. Follow me if you want to be a fisher of men. If you want to be useful, follow in my footsteps, is what he was declaring. I understand this first in this sense that we need to be separated unto Christ. We need to separate ourselves from the world and become a follower of Jesus Christ. These men were to leave their pursuits. It doesn't mean that they didn't have hopes and dreams. It didn't mean that they didn't have families. It didn't mean that they didn't have goals or other interests. But they had to leave those other pursuits in order to follow after Christ. They were to leave their companions. They were, in fact, to quit the world. That their one business might be, in their master's name, to be fishers of men. We're not all called to leave our daily business or to quit our families. Understand that. It doesn't necessarily mean that the Lord told you to quit your job and to follow after him. But if that is the requirement, and if that's what he requires of you, then it's imperative that we be obedient to the leading of the Spirit. We're not all called to leave our daily business or quit our families. That might be rather running away from the fishery than working at it in God's name. Fish will not be fishers. Think about it. Fish will not be fishers. The sinner will not convert the sinner. Now this doesn't mean that I have not heard sinners 
declare the gospel of Christ. Felder, I have been in many a bar and heard backslidden Christians and backslidden preachers talking about the Lord and, and quoting scripture and doing those things, yet no one was converted. Nobody's life was changed. Why? Because a sinner cannot convert a sinner. Amen. If we are to be effective at being fishers of men, we must follow Christ. The ungodly man will not convert the ungodly man. And what is more to the point, the worldly Christian will not convert the world. Amen? The worldly Christian will not convert the world. If you are of the world, no doubt the world will love you as its own. But you cannot save the world if you walk in darkness and belong to the kingdom of darkness. You cannot remove the darkness. If you march with the armies of the wicked one, you cannot defeat them. I believe that one reason why the church of the living God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. Amen. So much of the world has crept into the church that we have, we have literally become, Sister Solomon, we, as preachers, we have almost become, it's become necessary for us to be production managers. We went to a growth conference, a very large growth conference, a very large church. And one of the things in this growth conference that they talked about that they said the future holds for the modern day local congregation is that just like at the Academy Awards where the stage is changed every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, whatever it is, where the, the stage is changed, they said it's only a matter of time before that infiltrates the local church to keep people's attention on the speaker. That they will, it will be necessary to change the environment and to change the, the stage and, and the, the way things look. It will, it will be necessary to do that to keep people's interest. Brother Anthony, how sad is that? What a sad commentary that has befallen the, the American church. That we no longer have a hunger for just the unadulterated, sound doctrine of the Word of God. But, but are we shocked? Can't be shocked because the Bible says in the last day people will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want to hear it. Amen. Give me something that makes me feel good about who I am. Amen. Give me something that makes me, that's going to get me from Sunday to Wednesday. Or from, in most cases, from Sunday to next Sunday. You know, don't give me too much because, because if, 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 you, if you start getting too personal, it's going to start getting too close and I'm going to become uncomfortable. And if I become uncomfortable, then, you know, I, I don't want to feel bad. And so, so if this continues, then I'm just not going to, I'm not going to stay there. I'll, I'll find somewhere else that will make me feel better about who I am. Sound familiar? Sounds like a lot of churches today, doesn't it? But this morning, I don't know about you, but Eric, if it's not sound doctrine, I don't want it. If we, if I have to become a production manager, I don't want to do this no more. Amen. I, I don't want to, you know, and, and understand, please understand the difference. You know, why we have props set up here. We're, we're not trying to draw your attention, okay? We, we're trying to keep your mindset in what we're doing for the entire month, okay? It's different than what we're talking about, what I'm preaching about here right now. But in so many churches, it has become a production that is extremely costly. I know pastors that have spent over $30,000 on sound equipment alone. And that's really just scratching the surface. I went to a church in Phoenix and it was over a hundred thousand dollars. They had spent over a hundred thousand dollars on their sound equipment. That didn't count, count the lighting system. It was, it was a man, and let me tell you something. Their soundboard was about as wide as this, all these, these benches. That was just their soundboard. It was, it was unbelievable. It was amazing. But you had to be a professional technician to be able to even operate it. The lighting system was unbelievable. I've got videos of it. I, it. It was it was it was a production. Okay, it was a production. They averaged 
13 people on the platform during worship service between the musicians and the worship team. 13 people on the platform. And they rotated that because it was a very large church. And so they had, they had a, a deep well of, of, of talent that was in that local church. But it was amazing because you could tell that, John, there were times when things were choreographed, and I knew it was being choreographed, that they had practiced their actions on stage. Folks, I don't want to go to a church where I have to practice worship. Amen? I don't want to go to a church, Brother Manuel, where I have to practice putting on for the Lord in hopes that somebody else will join in. I remember Terry and I going to a church and, and we were on the worship team and, and, uh, and the pastor's wife instructed Terry to, um, to just fake it. To just fake it. You know, because they were very animated. The other parts of the worship team were very animated. And Terry was, you know, see Terry, she's pretty reserved. Well, now she's starting to get a little animated. You know. Dustin usually has talks with her once or twice a week. Come on, Mom. You know, uh, because Terry is usually very, very reserved. And so um, she, and she took Terry aside and Terry, she tried to encourage her to, to be animated. And Terry said, that's just not me. That's not when the Holy Ghost moves on me. I'm as animated as anybody else, but the Holy Ghost will move on me that way, then I, I, I don't want to fake that. And her response was, oh, they all fake it. Don't worry about it. You know, it, we all start out in the flesh. It's okay. What we're trying to do is we're trying to provoke people into uh, to participating in worship. And Terry said, well, then I don't want to be on the worship team. Because that's not pure. That's not, it's not God. I don't want to be part of it. Now that's a difficult, and folks, I'm telling you, church is filled with this environment, okay? But following Christ is not something I should, that I have to pretend. Do you? It's not something I have to pretend. I don't need, I don't need somebody to provoke me into loving the Lord. You know why I love the Lord? Because he loved me first. When I was unlovable, yeah. amen, and that may have been yesterday. You don't never know. <laughs> Thank God he loved me when nobody else did. And he continues to love me in spite of me. Amen? Amen. So I don't need somebody to provoke me into following Jesus. Sometimes we need encouragement, though, don't we? Sure, sure, we need encouragement. But you know what? We should, we should serve the Lord because of what he has already done for us. And if we will serve him in that way... It's easy to separate myself from the world. You know what? The more in love I fall with Jesus, the less in love I fall with the world, or I remain with the world. We must understand that to follow Christ must entail our ceasing to follow the things of the world. You can't follow Christ and follow the things of the world too. You, you're going to follow one or the other. The old adage of, you know, which dog are you feeding? Right? Right? If, you feel, if you're feeding the worldly dog, that's going to be the one that's got the biggest bite. Amen? But if we will feed our spiritual man, feed your spiritual man. Don't allow yourself to be so influenced by the world that the spiritual man becomes anemic. You need to make sure that you're feeding that spiritual man. Compromise leads to sin and sin to destruction. Separation from the world does not mean, however, that we have no dealings with the world. Understand me very clearly. You cannot be a fisher of men and have nothing to do with the world. Amen. But though I am in the world, I'm not of the world. Amen. Though I have, though I, though I have to have dealings with the world, I must learn to love people and despise the sin. To reach a world, we must interact with the world. But this does not mean we compromise our belief system in order to be all things to all men. Amen. Listen, if I go to Germany on a mission trip, it doesn't mean I'm going to belly up to the bar because somebody else is doing it. Okay, well, let me tell you a story. A pastor friend of mine goes to Europe. And, and they're all sitting there. They're in Ireland. They're all sitting there, and they're all drinking ale. Everybody, the children, that's their, that's their normal customary drink, okay? 
And so it doesn't mean they sit there and chug down brews until none of them can see enough to walk to the car. But it's like, it's like people in different countries have a glass of wine. Okay? Now, understand something. This pastor refused. No, thank you. I'll drink water. Okay? He was polite about it, but he told them, I don't drink. While they were sitting there, a lady leans over and whispers to him, I heard they drink coffee in America. And to her, that was, it bordered on being unchristian. You understand different customs. Okay? Some countries, they eat beetles. Doesn't mean I'm going to. Amen? In some countries, they eat scorpions. Doesn't mean I'm going to. See, Brother Anthony is going to leave. His, his mouth is watering back there. I can see it right now. Listen, in the Philippines, they eat monkey on a stick. Okay, I might try that. It doesn't mean I don't know that that would be my regular diet. But, you know. So, listen, there are customary things. But we have to follow our convictions. You know why I don't drink? Okay, because, because there is no purpose for me to drink. There's no purpose in it. It doesn't edify me. It doesn't do anything for me. Because I told you, the only reason in my life, the only reason I drank was to get drunk. That was the only purpose for me. I was never a social drinker. It was like eating Lay's potato chips. You could not eat just one. Nor could I drink just one. Listen, folks. I'm an Irish Indian. Part of me loves to drink. Part of me, it's not profitable for me to drink. Hello? It's, it's, it's dangerous for shame to be a drunkard. Come on, folks, I, I, I'm preaching good here. We have to be careful, folks, that we don't compromise our convictions, amen, our convictions, to try to fit in with the world. Because remember, a sinner cannot convert a sinner. Now, am I saying that if you drink a glass of wine, you're a sinner? That ain't none of my business because I ain't God. Amen. I can tell you what I believe. I can tell you what the church teaches. But this is a part of that you need to work out your salvation. Amen. Okay. I'm going to get off on that before we really get eyeball deep into something. I will tell you this, if it was part of your life in the world, it should not be your part, it should not be part of your life as a new creature. Let me just put it that simple. If that was part of your life in the world, it should not be part of your new life in Christ. Whether it's good, bad, or different, whether you think it's bad, whether you think it's evil, if it was part of your life there, it should not be part of your life here. I'm just going to stop right there. To reach a world, we must interact with the world, but that does not mean we compromise our belief system in order to be all things to all men. Quite the contrary. We are to love the people, but hate the worldliness of sinners. Not hate sinners. Hate the worldliness of sinners. Amen? Removing yourself from the worldliness that influences your lives and clinging to the Lord and all of his characteristics can only establish this. The second thing we need to do if we are going to become fishers of men is we must understand that there is something for the Lord to do in your life. It's not something you can do for yourself. Turn your Bible, if you will, over to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. Is that any better? Can you read that any better this week? I'm telling you, it's difficult to have a colorblind guy trying to match colors to make it readable for you. Because <laughs> it's readable to me, but I don't know if it is to you. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. And walking along beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you. The King James Version says, I will make you to become. The King James Version says, adds in to become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And when he, uh, he going further, 
from there uh, a little, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. From Mark's point of view, Jesus was telling the disciples that you may not be now, but eventually you will be. That's what it means to become. To become. Mark has this word, not Matthew. Mark has this word, not Matthew. It means, this word become, it means to turn out to be. To turn into, to develop into. Be converted into or to grow to be. In the King James Version found in Mark, it, it, it's very clear. He says, and Jesus says to them, come after me and I will make you to become fishers of men. In other words, he was looking at them, John and saying, you're not there yet, but you will be if you'll follow me. I will develop in you the ability to become fishers of men. It would be a slow and long process, but Jesus could and would do it. He would undertake, <coughs> excuse me, to make fishers of men out of fishermen. Preachers are made out of laymen who will, who are willing to leave their business for service for Christ. I was not always a preacher. I was not always called to be a preacher. And when the Lord called me to be a preacher, I told him, forget it, leave me alone. I was, not, I was not excited about that prospect. Amen. That's not something I envisioned. My parents were even more discouraged than I was. Why? Because, because there were preachers on both sides of our family, and my parents had seen the lives that those preachers had to live and the difficulties that they had to face. And so when I came and I told my folks that the Lord had called me to preach, they weren't thrilled. And then when I came and told them that I was called to pastor, they were even less excited about that. See, preaching the gospel is one thing. Pastoring becomes a whole other world. All preachers can preach. Not all preachers can pastor. Amen. And even some of us pastors, we don't do it really good. <laughs> but I want you to know that it's something that we're called to do. I had a pastor when I was on a sabbatical. And I was an associate at the time. I was on the worship team. I was playing the piano, doing all the things. I was still busy, very busy. I was preaching, doing revivals and different things. And I was still very, very active. And we went to a conference. I went to this conference with this pastor. And when we were there, they were introducing us. And, and these pastors that were coming up to us, they said, well, what do you do? Are you a pastor? No, no, I'm a, I'm a piano player. And the first day at this conference, Eric, that's how I introduced myself. I'm, I'm a piano player. I'm a piano player at this, at, at, at my pastor's church. And um, after the first day, my pastor pulled me aside and rebuked me for it. He said, don't you ever, don't, let, don't ever say it again. You're not a piano player. You're a pastor. I don't care if you're playing the piano. You're a pastor because God called you. I don't care if you're driving a school bus. I don't care if you're swinging a hammer. I don't care if you're swinging from vines in the middle of a jungle. God has called you to be a pastor, and it doesn't make any difference what you are actively doing at the moment. You're a God-called pastor. Stop introducing yourself as anything less. Amen. And it took me a while to embrace that because I wasn't. And I, was, I was the piano player. And, and I, I tried to argue with the pastor about it. But eventually I had to submit to the pastor because I realized what he was saying was true. It doesn't make any difference what I'm doing. I'm still a pastor. If I'm crawling around at the parsonage on my hands and knees and putting in a floor, I'm still a pastor. Amen. If I'm driving a school bus like I did for a while, but if I'm driving a school bus and I'm picking up children, you know what? I'm still a pastor. If I'm promoted to be the assistant, um, the assistant manager, the assistant supervisor uh, in the transportation department and I'm overseeing you know, over 180 drivers, um, all of the students, all of the faculty, all of this blah, 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 blah. You know what? I was a pastor. I was the problem solver. Everything that went on in the transportation department between the staff, the students, 
um, the drivers, any of those, guess who they came to? They came to me. And in fact, my supervisor was an ex-pastor. And he told me, he said, you're the perfect man for the job because I need a pastor. I was like, wow, okay, that's pretty cool. And what I realized was that the Lord, you know what? Even after all the years that I have been doing this, this is why the Lord put me in that position for a very distinct purpose, to teach me how to grow and to teach me certain things about myself. And that's what, it, you know, for that period of time, I was in training. Because I would go to work, and I would sit with my supervisor, and he would call me into the office. And he would say, and he would say let's talk about perception." And he says, sometimes you get so focused in what you're doing, people think you're mad about something. I said, I'm not mad about anything. He said, I know, but it's perception. And people won't approach you because they think, they see on your face. He said, they don't realize that you're focusing on something else. But on your face, it shows that there's something wrong. Perception. Shane, if you lose, if you, if you give the wrong perception to somebody, then what happens? You lose your opportunity for influence. That's what I got when I was at work for the school district. And then I would come to church and I would sit down with my pastor. And my pastor would say, Shane, let's talk about perception. I was in training. But I wasn't a novice. I've been, I've been a pastor in a long time. But there were still things that needed to be developed in me. And how many knows today I'm still being developed? Amen? We're all still being developed. That's why I say it doesn't make any difference how long we've served the Lord. We're still being developed. There's still a word that God is doing in you. <coughs> From Mark's point of view, he was talking about what they could become. And, and he was helping us to understand that this is a process that sometimes takes a long period of time. Preachers are made out of laymen who are willing to leave their business for service for Christ. From Matthew's point of view, Jesus was telling the disciples that you have no ability to turn yourselves. I must be the one to do it. The word make, as found in Matthew 4.19, means to create or to put together, to manufacture, to build, to construct, or to formulate. These, are, these as you can see, are two distinct opinions. Though similar in their overall meaning, they approach the aspect of becoming fishers of men from an entirely different direction. Each one very distinct. To become fishers of men, you must, as stated earlier, first be a disciple. You must be a follower of Christ. Andrew and Simon were fishermen by trade and had already become disciples of Jesus. For the Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verse 35, again the next day afterward, John stood with what? Two of his disciples. They were already followers of Christ. They had just not met Christ yet. Amen. And what does verse 36 say? And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he says to who? He says to his disciples, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and what did they do? They began to follow after Jesus. So they understand they were already disciples. Amen. Just as we studied on the vessels and the power that the potter has over the lump of clay to make one under honor or dishonor, so too if we are to become fishers of men. It takes a sovereign God developing us over a period of time into the fishermen he has desired us to be. One of my favorite TV shows that's on TV today is Deadliest Catch. Love the show. This is a job that one does not simply show up on the docks in, a fishing, in fishing attire, jump on the boat, and go out and become a fisherman. If you've ever watched the show, if you've ever watched it, you'll see that every so often they get what they call a greenhorn. This is a, this is a brand new fisherman. This is somebody that they're, that they're it's, it's, it's like when I was working construction, you always knew a guy when they showed up to a construction site for the very first time that had no experience. His shoes were brand new. His hard hat was brand new and shiny. Had no dirt or anything on it. His tool belt, he had just gotten it off the rack at Lowe's. 
His hammer had never hit anything. He had, he had very little skill ability. And it showed simply by the way he was dressed. Now, what I would do if I started a new job and, I, and they gave me in some jobs, they required you to wear a, a hard hat that was associated with a particular company. And so if, if I always had my own hard hat, but they would sometimes make me wear theirs. And so the first thing I would do is I would take that hard hat outside and I would throw it all over the place. I would kick it up and down and I would scrape it on stuff because I did not want to be viewed as, as a greenhorn. Amen. I'd go to a pawn shop and buy me a tool bag if I didn't have one. Because I did not want to show up with brand new tools. Because a greenhorn's job is difficult. They get all of the bad jobs. Amen. When you don't want to go pick up a board, you tell a greenhorn to go pick it up for you. <laughs> right, Eric? Am I telling the truth? Listen, to be, a, to be a greenhorn on a job, to be a rookie or a novice on a job, is usually not a good place to be. Well, in this, on this show, Deadliest Catch, these young men, they go in there as a, as a greenhorn, and, and most of them, the first thing that they do is they just experience the seasickness is terrible. See, that's why I could never do it, because, you know, I, I would love to go fishing with these guys, but I just see no joy in hanging my head over the side, puking my guts out the whole time. I, I just find no joy in that whatsoever. But that's what I would do because I get terribly seasick. And so you find these guys, they go on there, and, and, and I remember one guy, one greenhorn that they had on one of the shows. And he had it in his mind, he had been a fisherman. He was a salmon fisherman, he had done different types of fishing, but he had never been on the Bering Sea as a crab fisherman. And so he came on with an attitude. I know what I'm doing. I've done this. This is no different than what I've done before. But you know what he found out? Crab fishing on the Bering Sea was very different. Amen. And by about halfway through the season, he wanted to quit. He didn't want to do it anymore. And for many of them, even making it through to the end of the season is a very difficult thing. Most cases, if they make it to the end of the season, it's one season and out. They don't want to do it no more. They've had their experience. They, have, they, they can now say, I was a crab fisherman, you know, on the Bering Sea, but that is not what they want to do for a living. It takes a very unique individual to become that type of fisherman. Sometimes, I think, my point is, a crabber is one who is developed over time. Over time. There's a young man that is on there that was, was on one of the boats, had worked on one of the boats out of Seattle, had been there for years. He got the opportunity. He was always saying he wanted to be a boat captain, always, always putting pressure on his boss. I want to be a captain. I want to be a captain. And, and he was young. And his, and his boss kept telling him, it, it'll take time. You'll get there, but not yet. Well, an opportunity came for him to be a captain on a different boat. And so he goes to his boss and he tells him, I have this opportunity. And his boss tells him, and he asks his boss, what do you think? He said, do you, want, do you want me to tell you the truth? And he said, well, yes, I, I respect what you say. He said, you're not ready. You're not ready. And he said, well, when am I going to be ready? He said, it takes time. And so he encouraged the young man, but the young man chose to become that, that captain of this other boat. So he goes out and on their first journey, he's out there and they set their string of pots and, and they go out there. Now there's an enormous amount of pressure, pressure that he did not understand because he had not been the captain. And so as they set their pots and they bring in that first string of pots, all of the pots were empty. They didn't get a single crab. And now he's in a panic because now his crew, man, they're ready to, they're ready to have an uprising. Because that's money that they're missing in their pockets. Okay? And so the, the, as the show goes on, we see him really starting to panic and the pressure is getting to him. And eventually he breaks down and he calls his captain. And he said, I don't know what to do. I can't find the crab. I've done everything I know to do. I, I need help. And so you know the captain tells him, okay, I'm going to work with you on this. You come to, I'll meet you at this particular location. This has always been a place where we have found crab. And so he takes him over there and he helped him. And he helped him. What I'm trying to say to you folks is that 
it takes development and it takes time to develop and to become fishers of men. Okay? You can't go through one class and suddenly be, a, uh, be effective at reaching people. You know why? Because people are people. They're different. Everybody's different. What worked, and we had to discover this as pastors, what worked in one area may not work in another area. What worked in one church may not work in another church. What was effective to one congregation may not be effective in another congregation. It's a developmental process for all of us. But understand it's something that Jesus does in your life, not me, not anybody else. If the Lord is not developing you, you're not developing. Can you say amen? See, this is why it's so important for us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because as we are doers of the word, we develop. Amen? The third thing I want to quickly, and this is the longest part, so I'm going to try and move very quickly through this. To become fishers of men, we must have a godly character. If we are going to become fishers of men, we must have a godly character. Character like honor is a word we take for granted and probably have an affinity for but likely have never really had to define and may struggle to do so when pressed. It's a word most men desire to have ascribed to them, and yet the standards of this attainment rather um, remain rather vague in our modern age. It's a, it, it's a, it's certainly, it's certainly not a word that's used as much as it once was. Cultural historian Warren uh, Sussman Research the rise and fall of the concept of character, tracing its uh, prevalence in literature and self-improvement manuals and guides popular in different eras. What he found is that the use of the term character began in the 17th century and peaked in the 19th century. Sussman writes that embodied a, that embodied a culture of character during the 1800s, Character was a key word in the vocabulary of Englishmen and Americans. And men were spoken of as having strong or weak character, good or bad character, a great deal of character or no character at all. Young people were admonished to cultivate real character, high character, and noble character, and told that character was the most priceless thing that they could ever attain. Starting at the beginning of the 20th century, however, Sussman found that the ideal of character began to be replaced by that of personality. I found this fascinating. You may walk out and say, I don't know what that had to do with anything, but if you'll bear with me, I think that you'll find some value in this study that he did. Character and personality are two different things. Amen? Amen? As society shifted from producing to consuming, ideas of what constituted the self began to transform. The rise of psychology, the introduction of mass produce, consumer goods, and the expansion of leisure time offered people new ways of forming their identity and presenting it to the world. In place of defining themselves through the cultivation of virtue, people's hobbies, dress, and material possessions became the new means of defining and expressing the self. At one time, virtue was considered a, a godly character, a very important character trait. But that was soon replaced, that was soon replaced by hobbies, dress, and material possessions. Sussman observed that the shift through the changing content of self-improvement manuals, which went from emphasizing moral imperatives and work to personal fulfillment and self-accumulation, the vision of self-sacrifice began to yield to that of self-realization. Let me say that again. The vision of self-sacrifice began to yield to that of self-realization. Who am I? How do I fit in? Right? Rather than being willing to sacrifice everything for a cause, it began, people began to shift to, how does it affect me? How does it affect mine? There was a fascination, the peculiarities of the self, while advice manuals of the 19th century and some as early 
as into the 20th century as well, emphasized what a man really was and did. The new advice manuals concentrated on what others thought he was and did. It used to be, I am what I do. It used to be. Then it became, I am what you think I am. And we become more concerned about what people think of us than, than sacrificing to become what the Lord wants us to be. Amen. Readers were taught how to be charming, how to control their voice, make a good impression. A great uh, example of this is Dale uh, Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People from 1936. It focused on how to get people to like you and how to get others to perceive you well versus trying to improve your actual inner moral compass. So rather than present yourself before the potter, let the potter recreate in you and restore you to a vessel of honor. What we were trained to do or what society was trained to do was to make a good impression and, and let that perception be what people think you are. Not really based on what your accomplishments were. I remember when I was growing up, my father used to talk about hard work. Hard work will determine who you are. When people see that you're a hard worker, they'll have respect for you because they see that you're a hard worker and that you're dedicated. Now there's a society today that wants to give the impression of being a hard worker. But they want to cut corners and do as little as possible. Amen. They still want the same respect, but they don't want to have to do the same work. Sussman argues that the transformation from a culture of character to a culture of personality was ultimately about a shift of achievement to performance. Character will split into good and bad, personality into famous and infamous. In a culture of personality, cultural, in a culture of personality, you can be famous without having done anything to earn it. It used to be that when they gave Nobel Peace Prizes away, people did something spectacular to earn it. Now they just give them away. Right? I'm not, I, I won't go there because we're on film. <laughs> But we know of a couple Nobel Peace Prizes that's been given away the last few years, and they, people didn't do nothing. One guy got it because of the color of his skin. Uh, well, okay. Because, I, because up to this point, I haven't found anything that they've done that constituted giving a, a Nobel Peace Prize away. Amen? It's all about perception now. How do people perceive me? Sussman illuminates this difference by nothing, uh, by noting that while the words most associated with character in the 19th century were, and get this, this is in the 19th century, these were the words that were associated with character. Citizenship, duty, democracy, work, building, golden deeds, outdoor life, conquest, honor, reputation, morals, manners, integrity, and above all, manhood. The words most associated with personality in the 20th in the 20th century were fascinating, stunning, attractive, magnetic, glowing, masterful, creative, dominant, forceful. No achievement at all. But people look at a person that is attractive and says, "Oh, oh, how much we want to be like them." Why do you think the Kardashians are still on TV? Not because of any achievement, but because they look pretty. Amen. All of our reality shows, they're based on looks. Drama. Not based on any achievement. See, I like, I like things like Axemen, and I like things like um, swamp people, and, and, I, and I like things like Deadliest Catch because these people are achieving something. They work hard at what they do. Amen. They're not pretty to look at. <laughs> Amen. My wife just loves when we watch Axemen and, and, and 
and we've got that swamp guy down there from Louisiana, you know, and you can't hardly understand a word he's saying most of the time. And, you know, he's missing teeth and he runs around in barefoot and, and, and shorts and, and dives in there in the water and he's down around them gators and this, that, and the other and, and shoots guns and, you know, and he's just crazy as a loon. And Terry just looks at him. She laughs at him all the time. But you know what? He's a hard worker. He has a reputation for being a hard worker. Achievement based on, or character based on achievement, not on looks. Henry, K, Henry Clay Trumbull explains the meaning of the word character, another name for the signature, or monogram, or personal subscription, or trademark of the potter, the painter, the sculptor, the writer, or any other artist or uh, artisan uh, or inventor, or uh, indicative of the personality of the maker, or the distinct individuality of the article marked. It is the visible token by which a thing is distinguished from every other thing with which it might otherwise be confounded. I want to read that last line again, and I'm, I'm going to have to just cut out a bunch of this so I can let you go. I want to read this last line. This is how this man describes... Uh, the word character. But the last line, I believe, is so very important. And think about what I just preached to you in this whole series about the vessels. I want you to think about this. He says this, it is the visible token by which a thing is distinguished from every other thing with which it might otherwise be confounded. In other words, we have the mark of Jesus Christ in our life. That's what separates us from others. You follow me? Your character is not built on your guitar playing. Your character is not built on your ability to pour concrete. What has separated us now is the distinguishing mark of Jesus Christ in our life. He found such great value in us that he chose us and he put his mark upon us. That's what distinguishes us from every other vessel that has been created. The mark of Jesus Christ in our life. If you are going to be an effective fisher of men, you must have godly character. Godly character is not going to be something that you develop on your own because man cannot change his own character. Amen? We preached at long, at the great length on that. You cannot change your character, but Jesus Christ can change who you are. Because the truth of it is, when, what Adam failed to do, Jesus Christ, the second man, Adam, came once for all to provide a way for us to be once again in the presence of his Father. As I close here this morning, and I have a lot more, I just don't have any more time. Many men feel like character is something that can only be built during dramatic test and crisis. Some people think, oh, I, I, you know, if, if drama's not happening, then, then I'm not serving the Lord correctly. But I want, you to, I want you to hear me close. Character is truly in the constant, habitual, hurried, routine acts of common life that, swarm, that are swarmed of the little judgments that we make every single day. We would do well to remember that we are being made every minute, every day, and we cannot help it. You are being developed every minute, every day. Every minute. Every choice you make is part of the process. Every trial you face is part of the process. Every joy that you experience is part of the process. Everything you go through is part of the process. But understand, you cannot change who you are. Only he can. So the three things we covered this morning. If you are going to be a fisher of men, you must follow Christ. You must be a follower of Jesus Christ. Secondly, you must realize there is something that the Lord has to do inside of you. Not something you do for yourself. It's something he has to do. And thirdly, if you're going to be effective at 
at fishing for men is you must display godly character. People must see that you're different from everybody else. Amen? I want you to stand to your feet. Now that may not be where you expected to go this morning with being fishers of men, but I believe it sets a real good solid foundation for where we're going to go this morning.